Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center and welcome to today's National Town Hall. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the president of the National Constitution Center. We begin our town hall programs by reciting together the National Constitution Center's mission, which comes from Congress. And it's especially meaningful to recite these inspiring words today. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis in order to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. Friends, during these tragic days, increasing awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people is more important than ever. It is central to the National Constitution Center's mission to convene discussions like the one that we're about to have about the difficult constitutional issues facing our nation so we can learn together in order to form a more perfect union. And that is the goal of today's convening. We have brought together some of America's most distinguished judges and scholars to discuss the issues at the center of American life regarding the Constitution, policing, and protests. We're going to be begin with a keynote conversation with Chief Judge Theodore McGee, who I'll introduce in a moment, and then we'll be joined at about uh, 12.30 by uh, four amazing scholars, uh, and we'll talk uh, until uh, 1.30. Friends, thank you so much for joining. This is a large and meaningful group. Thank you for taking time out of your day to discuss these crucial issues. Please put lots of questions in the Q&A box and uh, focus on constitutional and legal questions. There's much for us to learn together and we have some of America's world experts on these tough questions. So put them in the Q&A box and I'll try to introduce them to our panelists in the course of the discussion. Come, let us learn together and now let the discussion begin. It is my great honor to introduce uh, Judge Theodore McGee. He has been a judge on the US Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit since 1994 and he served as chief judge from 2010 to 2016. Uh, before being appointed to the federal bench, he was a state trial judge. He chaired the Pennsylvania Sentencing Commission, and he was an assistant US attorney in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania and deputy city solicitor for the city of Philadelphia. Uh, he's a great judge and a great friend of the National Constitution Center. Judge McGee, thank you so much for joining today. Well, thank you for the invitation and for those extraordinarily and excessively kind words. There's so much for us to discuss, but I wanted to begin with some moving words uh, from you. Um, in, in a reflection celebrating your quarter century on the bench, you wrote uh, that you grew up in Rochester, New York, in a small town near Scottsville uh, in 1947, and you said, I still have vivid images of fire hoses being turned on the peaceful marchers in Birmingham and of college students sitting in segregated lunch counters and getting ketchup poured over them and being insulted just because they were demanding the right to eat in public accommodations. And you went on in subsequent writings to talk about I think that says something about how deep racism is ingrained in all of us. If Nelson Mandela can have that thought upon seeing a black pilot, I would submit to you that none of us is beyond the destructive and poisonous reach of racism. Judge McKee, in light of the extraordinary events that have convulsed America over the past weeks, what are your reflections about who we are and the future of the American idea? As if your remarks are incredibly apropos in your reference to Nelson Mandela's passage in his book where he talks about the fear that overtook him upon seeing a black pilot. And then at that moment realizing how he had internalized the racist messages that he'd grew up around. I really think that is something we must address if we're to ever really solve this problem. I don't have a lot of hope. I'm more hopeful lately because of the diverse nature of the people who have taken to the streets and peaceful protests to demonstrate and, and ask for redress. But I'm still not hopeful. And I think we can't really make progress until we come to grips with who we are. And, and that is direct, directly responsive to your question. I read uh, from an editor, editorial columnist who I have great respect for last week in the Philadelphia Inquirer column where she said, 
this is not who we are. And upon reading that, I thought to myself, I'm not so sure about that. This country was born um, in slavery. It was funded, funded upon the institution of slavery. The institution of slavery greatly funded, primarily funded the American Revolution. The United States Constitution, which some people have referred to as a sacred document, deals with slavery by perpetuating the slave trade, guaranteeing the federal government can't interfere with the slave trade for 20 years after the passage of the Constitution. Um, what we're seeing today, I think, is the direct result of a lot of governmental policies as well as social policies. There is a concept called shooter's bias. And I think in order to really understand what's going on with excessive force, it's something that people need to understand. They can they just do a Google, Google search of shooter's bias and they will get the research. It'll come right up. But many, many studies have shown that police officers are much more inclined to shoot uh, unarmed black men than they are armed white males. And this is because of the imprinting of the bias, the subliminal bias that you referred to, that, uh, that starts teaching us from the very, very beginning when we're born that black people somehow are to be feared um, and that our rights are not as worthy of protection as um, as white folks are. There's a wonderful book called The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, where he traces the segregating of America, not by living patterns and people moving to better school districts, but by deliberate governmental attempts arising after um, the Second World War, and to a lesser extent, the First World War, in housing policies, housing funding policies, who got funded to own homes. That policy continued going back before that, when slavery was ended, the country went to a system, that, at least in the southern states, of, um, of um, slave, of, of convict leasing, which was really just a uh, metamorphosis of a slave system which had preceded it. Until we realize that is not only a large part of who we are, but also that the subliminal bias that you referred to, that it is in all of us, that has got to be taken as who we are. A statement was once made many years ago that a black person, then I think the term was Negroes, have no rights that a white person is bound to respect. That was not made by a, a member of the Ku Klux Klan, or they may have been a member of the Ku Klux Klan. It was made by the then Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And the opinion in which he wrote that statement, um, uh, Dred Scott, was joined by six justices. So the United States Supreme Court, speaking through seven justices offered by a single justice, made the proclamation that black folks have no rights that a white person is bound to respect. The Kerner Commission years later talked about a, um, uh, a society that we're evolving into two societies, separate and increasingly unequal, going back to the language of Plessy versus, versus Ferguson uh, in the late 1800s. That to me is who we are. And until we come to grips with that fundamental racist boogeyman that has infected us since the very beginning, so what some have referred to as original sin, we're not going to be able to get a handle on this because we're not going to be able to honestly confront what is really at the root of it. There, there are laws which are put in place which are very noble uh, in their uh, uh, reach and in, very, in their noble and their idealism, but those laws are not consistent with what a lot of people in this society are experiencing. And we can certainly get into the laws that protect people assembling and also protect police officers from several lawsuits. But until we really come to grips, as I said, with who we are, the police officers that are responding in large part to what they've been taught subconsciously, I don't, I'm not saying they're all racist, but I do think each one of us, including black folks, as Nelson Mandela pointed out, has that grain imprinted in them from society that there's something inherently and uniquely different about black folks that sets us apart from, from white folks. And we've, we've got to realize that. Thank you, Judge, for those extraordinarily moving and important opening thoughts for recalling the words of Chief Justice Taney and recalling the heroes who opposed him, including John Brown and Frederick Douglass, all of whom are described in the exhibit on the Civil War and Reconstruction, which is in the building behind me and which I can't wait to welcome everyone to once we can open again. You mentioned uh, two large topics, uh, police immunity and the rights of protesters. We already have lots of questions from our friends who are watching and many of them deal with police immunity. Donna Ferrari asks, until recently I didn't know there was police immunity. Where did that concept come from? So tell us about this idea of police or qualified immunity, where it come from, and then tell us about how you, when you were a, a, a U.S. attorney, you, you had trouble getting convictions of some officers because of this notion of police immunity. 
Well, we did. Well, I was, the situation I ran into was a little bit different. Qualified immunity, as it's called, refers to a protection from civil lawsuit. Um, and it says that in order for a police officer to be found liable in a suit for aggressive, uh, uh, excessive force or something of that sort of constitutional tort or regular tort, that the officer has to violate a clearly established constitutional or statutory right. And a reasonable officer in that officer's position should have known that he or she was violating a clearly established or violating a constitutional principle. When we talk about what is a clearly established constitutional right, it gets, it's really easy. Everybody knows the right to speech, the right to assemble, the right to petition for redress. Those are clearly established right. That's the easy part. The difficult part is trying to prove that an officer should have known that the conduct, and this is the conduct that they're engaging in, was such as to have violated that clearly established right. So you have to really get into the weeds of the individual's conduct. The focus of the lens is not at the level of the Bill of Rights. It's at the level of what was going on at the moment the conduct which gave rise to the lawsuit uh, occurred. Would someone in that situation have reason to know that they were violating a clearly constitutional, or a clearly established right. That usually requires a Supreme Court case or a circuit court case or a statute which would specifically tell the officer that their conduct was improper. It is there because we don't want situations where an officer has to second guess and hesitate their conduct when they're uh, affecting a legal arrest. So that if every time an officer used excessive force, that was in fact found to be excessive by a court later on, they were liable, that would not be a good state of affairs. And so qualified immunity arose in order to protect the reasonable officer. And the, the word reasonable there is really crucial. The reasonable officer going about his or her duties. And my, I can respond to the second part if you want to in terms of my own prosecution. That, that would be great because the story of your prosecution is uh, really interesting. This was many years ago, it had been 1977, 78, where I was involved when I was an assistant U.S. attorney with uh, violating, uh, with, I'm sorry, with prosecuting police officers who had engaged in the use of excessive force using the federal civil rights statute. And I can't get too much into the specific details of my case because of, it was grand jury material, but it was an attorney's dream case. It was a white defendant was set upon by a I'm sorry, yeah, it was a white defendant, set upon by a police dog controlled by a white officer. It was in the middle of the afternoon, so we don't get into the issue of uh, what were they doing out there in the middle of the night, they're up to no good. That kind of argument from defense counsel was taken off the table. The uh, victim did not have a prior record, so that was uh, taken off the table. Um, it was really the perfect record. I had a uh, expert witness from the Philadelphia Police Force who was giving me incredibly strong testimony that eliminated the only problem I saw in the case, and that was whether or not the peace dog simply didn't obey a command. Um, my expert took care of that. The grand jury did not indict, and after they handed back the unsigned um, uh, true bills, it's called, I asked the foreperson, I said to him, well, you didn't sign the indictment, thinking he just forgot to sign the indictment, how could you not indict? And he said to me, no, we, I, I didn't forget you to sign the indictment, we decided not to indict, and I asked, can I ask why? And he said, well, you can't, tie the hands of police officers. You, you're going around here with this and you're going to tie the hands of police officers, prevent them from doing their job. I asked him what the vote was and it was about two thirds not to indict to one third to indict, which I was flabbergasted. And the person who was then U.S. attorney um, jokingly told me that even though any assistant U.S. attorney could get an indictment against the hamburger, somehow McKee couldn't get an indictment against the <laughs> police officer when his main witness was an expert uh, uh, from the police department. It's very, very difficult to do. When you add into that the subliminal messages of, of racism, um, it becomes even more difficult. The fact that we've been defined, black folks, as somehow being more dangerous than white folks. Um, it's easy for a jury to relate to an officer who says, I was concerned for my own safety. I thought I had to use that level of force to protect myself. And to dissuade jurors from that uh, by proof which meets the burden for a criminal conviction, and I'm mixing criminal and civil here, uh, which is proof beyond a reasonable doubt, is extraordinarily difficult in the best of circumstances. Civil liability is not easy either because of the doctrine of um, qualified immunity that we just discussed, but that is a court created doctrine. It's not in statutes, it's not in the constitution, it's a creature of the courts. Thank you very much for that. And with our next panelist, we'll delve into the point that you just made, Judge, which is that the original statute, the Ku Klux Klan Act of the Reconstruction period, did 
it was based on federal common law and it was the Supreme Court relatively recently that, that created this doctrine of, of uh, qualified immunity and there are bills pending in Congress to change it and uh, we'll talk more about those in a moment. Um, first of all, I'm just blown away with the rigor and uh, magnitude of the questions from our friends. There are 57 so far and they're really good. Well, that's heartening. That, that is heartening. <laughs> And what also is heartening is that Ann Landenson writes, just looking at Judge McKee's bio and discovered that today is his birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This wasn't that how he planned to spend my birthday a few weeks ago. <laughs> well, I would, I would ask everyone. Good to thing sing. we are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to celebrate with you and educating the public about the Constitution. Well, thank you. It's a great way to spend your birthday. Um, there are a whole bunch of questions about the balance between the rights of protesters and the need to maintain public order. Uh, Crystal Gaskin asks, why are the rights of protesters repeatedly being denied their First Amendment uh, rights nationwide? Can you give us a broad sense of what the law of protest is? Yeah. What, yeah. Broadly, as we all, I think we all know that there is in the First Amendment, one of the rights protected there, there the other is, is the right of assembly. Um, you have a right to assemble, to peacefully assemble. Uh, the government can place certain regulations on that. They can make, they can regulate the time, the place, and the manner of the uh, of the assembly, as long as they do so in a manner which is content neutral. For example, they can't have one set of regulations in time, place, or manner for folks espousing a point of view that the government might favor, and another set of regulations which are uh, more onerous for folks who are uh, advocating a point of view the government disfavors. Within that, the basically the right of assembly is protected. I will go one step further and 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 note that, in terms of a civil suit, and this came up in the West uh, Minister Baptist case that many people are familiar with. In terms of civil liability, the right of assembly is also there. But there, the right of assembly really deals with a matter of public concern. If if folks are going out on the street because they're concerned, uh, for example, a large family is concerned that Uncle Johnny gave. Uh, Aunt Monica, the tea set, and I should have gotten it, and you organize a parade around that. That is not the kind of assembly that the First Amendment extends to. Um, very interesting. And uh, without commenting on particular cases, when can the uh, police uh, shut down a peaceful protest in order to protect the public safety of public officials? That's basically it. When the protest begins to, when the conduct creates a clear and present danger of a substantial evil that the government's entitled to guard against, then the government can step in and do what they have to do to eliminate or minimize that danger. Again, it has to be in a way, in a way which is content neutral. So if there are armed folks on one side of the street that are identified as being left wing and armed folks on the right side of the street that are um, um, identified as being right wing and there's uh, tension going back and forth and conflict and it looks like fist fights are going to break out. The police can step in and stop that, but they can't stop it by simply restraining the people on the left side of the street. They have to also restrain the people on the right side of the street or pose barriers so that they can't get to one another, which would probably be the better way to do it. That, that's very important, but there does, as you said, have to be a clear and present danger and the standard test for restricting speech from the, from the Brandenburg cases, there has to be uh, an imminent uh, risk of uh, substantial evil and the speech has to be both uh, intended to and likely to produce that imminent risk. So you, you, you can't just step in without an actual threat of disruption. Right. And I will add to that, the fact that peace uh, speech or assembly, which is otherwise lawful, uh, may have the effect of creating anger or hostility or provoking people. That does not remove the cloak of protection from that speech. Uh, and police need to do what they have to to protect the speakers in that situation. So, and that is the Westminster Baptist uh, Church case. Um, it is not the fact that people get, are offended by the speech, no matter how onerous the speech is, no matter how provocative it might be. In fact, in that case, and I can't remember who wrote it, I think it was Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, said, in fact, the most effective speech is oftentimes the most provocative speech. So we don't have a, what's called a heckler's veto. The person hearing the speech cannot intercede or be aroused and become unruly and thereby um, put a mouthpiece or a gag on the people who are otherwise peacefully assembling. James Klein asks, does one have a right to peaceably assemble if it would violate a curfew? If it's a generalized curfew, well, I actually probably shouldn't get into that because we have a curfew in Philadelphia and I can see 
those cases coming to me. So let me leave that one alone. Okay. Um, Beth George, are police permitted to use force if peaceful protesters are protesting after the time of curfew? In New York, it seemed that different demographic neighborhoods are being treated differently, more harshly in the Bronx versus those in downtown Manhattan. Well, when you get into differential treatment, that, there you do have a problem. Um, and the, the, the state has a problem. They can't differentially treat people. If they have to exercise force to enforce a curfew, I don't know what you mean by force. I don't know whether it's uh, escorting the person off the street, if it's locking them up, arresting them. Uh, I don't know, but that gets into a very murky area. They can enforce a curfew. Again, they've got to do it in a neutral way, and that doesn't mean that the curfews uh, are enforced in the black and the Puerto Rican neighborhoods and they're not enforced in the white neighborhoods. That would be a motion for, for an injunction to stop that kind of um, dualistic behavior. And, and give us a broad sense of uh, what the Fourth Amendment law of excessive force is. How does the Constitution restrain the police? It basically has to be reasonable. Uh, reasonable in the context of the circumstances of the officer. Uh, and, and that takes in all of the considerations. It can factor in um, the, how boisterous the crowd is, how many people are around, uh, the physical positioning. Is the officer in a position where their back is to the wall or the back is to a vehicle and they can't safely pull out a baton or can't get to the pepper spray or they're afraid if they reach for the pepper spray that they're going to be attacked. But it's got to be reasonable. It can't be based upon fear and I'd say irrational, but that kind of contradicts what I said at the beginning, because when you start from the assumption of the level to which we're all trained to view black folks as more dangerous, one could then argue that they're acting reasonably when they uh, act too quickly to use force which becomes excessive. That's not what I'm talking about by the officer acting reasonably. I'm talking about an objective kind of reasonableness, not a subjective kind of reasonableness. Uh, there's the famous case of excessive force, the Tennessee Garner case, which says that it's not reasonable to use deadly force to stop a, someone who's fleeing. Tell us more about that. Well, it's exactly it. If someone is running, running away, it's no longer, re the, the reason for using force would be to protect oneself, possibly to effectuate um, a legal arrest. If someone is running away, there's no need to act to protect yourself if you're uh, an officer. Um, I guess it's probably a little bit trickier when you get into whether or not you can do that to effectuate an arrest, but I think the law is pretty clear that you can't do it. There are other means by which you've got to try to effectuate that arrest. You can't just um, point the gun and shoot. There's a body of law when you get into fleeing felons and the extent to which you can use deadly force to apprehend a fleeing felon, that is again something that I can see popping up in our court and I probably should, should not get into that. A, a series of questions about your really powerful comments about unconscious bias. Carolyn Burns says, I believe biases are taught, not imprinted uh, since birth. Give us a sense of, of, of your thoughts about how best to combat the unconscious bias that you described. I think first we have to be aware that they're there. Um, and when I say imprinting, I would view imprinting as a kind of teaching. So I don't mean teaching in terms of uh, formal education. It is imprinting, and I call that uh, teaching. It's a kind of collective social teaching. But we, unless we recognize they're there, we can't fight them. The studies that I talked about with shooters bias have also shown many of them that when officers are shown the extent to which they're more apt to shoot an unarmed black person than an armed white person, they will then take measures to reduce that level of um, irrational impulsive reaction. I don't know of any study who's been uh, that's been conducted in a long-term follow-up. The studies that I'm familiar with have been conducted with one set of uh, imprinting or, or conditioning of the officer, measuring the response, and then dealing with the officer's responses, showing that they're biased, and then testing again. Um, I'm not sure, and I know there are some scholars in this area who say, you can't fix that. You just can't fix it. That maybe you can fix it for a day or a week or even a month, but long-term, the message is just too ingrained and you just cannot fix it. It's a complicated problem because you don't want officers to have to hesitate for too long when they're on the street. So you don't want them kind of going through a whole kind of sociological, anthropological analysis before they use deadly force. If they reasonably believe they have to use deadly force in that situation to protect themselves. But you also don't want officers assuming that a situation involving a black person or black folks or Hispanic people uh, necessarily rises to the level of justifying deadly force, whereas they wouldn't in a, in a white neighborhood or with a white person or uh, a more affluent person. And I should mention also, it's not just about 
race. That's, that's a huge part of it. I think it's, it's class as well as caste. And what race I would put in the caste basket, I think it's also class. I mean, uh, to the extent that someone appears to be disadvantaged and poor, um, I don't think they'd catch the same kind of hell that black folks would catch if it's a, a poor disadvantaged white person, but they're certainly not uh, immune from the kind of disfavored social views and disfavored social treatment. Fascinating. Just the, the questions are coming so powerfully, and I, I think it's time for your closing thoughts before we bring in the rest of the panel. But we're getting several questions from our friends uh, asking about whether or not you think that the Constitution is still serving people in the 21st century. So your thoughts on that and any other final uh, wisdom that you'd like to leave our audience with would be great. Well, it, from the beginning, it always served people. Uh, as I mentioned, from the beginning, it served people who were importing slaves for 20 years to protect the right to import slaves. It's always served people. The question is, does it serve everybody in the same way? And I don't know. Uh, I'm, not, I'm a little more hopeful now, as I said earlier, because I see the heterogeneity of the people who are out there peacefully protesting. I saw one shot the other day, I think in Washington, of it must have been about 55 people peacefully kneeling to commemorate uh, the memory of uh, George Floyd. And I, don't, and I made it a point to count. I think I counted the three black faces identifiably black in that crowd. There may have been others that I couldn't identify as black. In that sense, I'm hopeful, but I've been hopeful before. I was hopeful when I'm, uh, they had the march across the Selma Bridge, the second march across the Selma Bridge. Um, I was hopeful when the Kerner Commission came out after LBJ appointed a commission to look into the, re the reasons for civil unrest and try to do something about it. But the statement from the Kerner Commission that I mentioned earlier is no less true today than it was back in 68 when the Kerner Commission came out and said that we're a society increasingly divided and increasingly unequal in terms of our maternal death rates. I think if you look at this, does not sound as far as field, it's not as far as field as it, as it may sound. The maternity uh, birth rate, uh, death rate in the United States, I think is either first or second. If you only look at the uh, maternal death rate, the survival rate of, of babies of black and Puerto Rican folks were 13th or 14th. Now that statistic was several years ago. I doubt we've gotten any better. The mayor, the governor of Minneapolis gave a beautiful speech the other day where he talked about how Minneapolis was second only to Hawaii on a happiness index, how Minneapolis uh, residents were thriving in terms of education and, and, and safety and well-being. But then he said that it, that's if you're white. If you look at how black folks are favoring, it's a very different story. And that's, that's a national scenario. So in terms of the Constitution serving people, it certainly protects fundamental freedoms. I'd like to think we're moving to a point where it protects the fundamental freedoms of everybody the same. That's the principle. We're trying to get there. That's a large part of what courts are there for. Whether we'll get there or not, I just don't know. The criminal justice system certainly needs to be worked on, and some of your panelists may well be able to address that. I think that's where you see the biggest inequities in terms of how the Constitution protects different people in different ways. Thank you so much, Judge McKee, for Thank you. an inspiring conversation. It's so meaningful that you took time as a representative of the federal judiciary in these anxious times to educate our fellow citizens about the Constitution and your words of caution and your words of hope are very, very meaningful. So well, I appreciate it. As I said, I'm not super hopeful, but as my grandmother used to say, and I think it's a saying of a religious denomination, it's better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. I don't want to just sit around cursing the darkness. So this is my candle for the day, and I appreciate being asked to light it. Thank you. Thank you for spreading light, and we're happy to give a candle for your birthday. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, now it's a great honor to bring in our fellow panelists, and I'm going to introduce them now. Uh, they are a, a remarkable group, and I'm going to uh, uh, introduce them uh, in turn. Uh, Monica Bell is an associate professor of law at Yale Law School and an associate professor of sociology at Yale University. Uh, David French is senior editor at The Dispatch and a columnist for time, as well as a former major in the US Army Reserve, uh, where he was deployed to Iraq and awarded the Bronze Star. Uh, Janae Nelson is Associate Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Uh, and Theodore Shaw is Julius L. Chambers, Distinguished Professor of Law at UNC Law School and the Director of the University of North Carolina Center for civil rights. 
Monica, David, Janae, and Ted, it is an honor to welcome all of you to our town hall. Let's begin with this question of qualified immunity for police officers. There's so many questions about it. There are bills pending in Congress to reform it. What I want to put on the table is how precisely it evolved. And I'll just uh, go uh, uh, yeah, in order. M M Monica, uh, tell us what, what the Ku Klux Klan Act after Reconstruction said about uh, how citizens could sue um, for violations of their constitutional rights and how the Supreme Court more recently developed and expanded this notion of qualified immunity that's controversial today. Yeah, so I'm actually going to uh, defer to another panelist to talk a little bit more about, about that doctrinal history. Um, uh, but one of them I think is really important to just kind of put on the table, and I'm picking up here a little bit from the previous conversation. I think what um, what we see in the conversation about qualified immunity is, is, is a desire to sort of do post hoc um, accountability for specific users. And one of the things that I think is super important to have on the table in our conversation about the role of the Constitution in protest is a much more sense of collective accountability and pre kind of earlier ways of thinking about the notion of accountability in policing. So that's something I want to get to before we kind of, I just want to put on the table as something to discuss later as other panelists talk about the kind of doctrinal points on qualified immunity. That's so powerful. And you've written so importantly about uh, notions of uh, how to, the police can maintain uh, legitimacy in communities. And look forward to digging into all of that as well. David French, you recently, uh, and actually not so recently too, about a year ago, written uh, pieces saying end qualified immunity. There are bills pending in Congress. They have bipartisan sponsorship, uh, ranging from Democrats to Justin Amash. And remarkably, on the Supreme Court right now, justices ranging from Justice Sonia Sotomayor to Justice Clarence Thomas have called for re-examining the idea of qualified immunity on the grounds that it is not rooted in the text or original understanding of the relevant statutes. Can you really help us understand wh where the doctrine came from, how it yeah. and why it should be reformed? So you had the, since 1871, federal law has permitted Americans to file lawsuits against public officials who violate their constitutional rights. And the statutory language here is, is really clear. Uh, it says, every person who under color of any statute, ordinance, regulation, custom usage, etc., cetera, um, or causes subjects or causes to be subjected any citizen of the United States or other person within the jurisdiction thereof to the deprivations of rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution and laws shall be liable to the party injured in an action at law. In other words, let's just put that in non legalese. If your rights are violated, you have a right to sue and recover damages. It's crystal clear. Well, for a while, uh, that there was no doctrine of qualified immunity that came out of that statute because the statute's very, very clear. But there began to emerge some sort of common law, good faith defenses. But then in 1982, uh, in a case called Harlow v. Fitzgerald, the Supreme Court really concocted, I mean, just made up the, the modern doctrine of qualified immunity. And, and what the doctrine said is that you had to prove that the public official who violated your rights was violating a clearly established statutory or constitutional right of which a reasonable person would have known. Well, what's clearly established? I mean, you'd think the First Amendment's clearly established, the Fourth Amendment is clearly established, but no, what they meant was, and, and uh, the judge before earlier said, said this you know, quite well, you, essentially what you have to find is a case very similar to your case in a court of controlling jurisdiction to and say, see, this was just adjudicated to be unlawful. This happened to me. And so therefore I can recover damages. And how close does the case have to be? I'll give you an example from a cert petition that's pending before the Supreme Court right now. And that is there's a case not far from where I live in Tennessee involving a man who was arrested and he surrendered and he was sitting up and he, he was obviously in surrendering and a police dog was sicked on him and attacked him and sent him to the ER. So he filed a lawsuit over the, the use of the police dog and there was a qualified immunity ruling because 
The only previous case law in regarding the police, a police dog involves someone who is lying down, not somebody who is sitting up in a posture of surrender. What? I mean, you have to get that precise. And so uh, this is going to be an interesting, I, I, there are multiple cert petitions pending. Um, this is going to be very interesting because if you're a textualist, as many of the uh, GOP, uh, you know, the, the Republican nominees are, if you're a textualist, where is qualified immunity in the text? Um, if you're an institutionalist, as some of them are, they take a look at it and they say, well, wait a minute, what will ending qualified immunity do to the institution of the police and the, and the government and, and such a dramatic change coming from the court? Well, the dramatic change from the court was Harlow v. Fitzgerald in 1982. Uh, so that's sort of the, the, the legal posture. And it's one of the reasons why you have this alliance uh, between uh, Justice Sotomayor and Justice Thomas on this issue. Justice Thomas is a textualist and he's going to look at that and he's going to say, I don't see qualified immunity in there. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Thanks for that really uh, helpful summary. Thanks for calling out Harlow versus Fitzgerald. Uh, NCC team, if you can put the site in the uh, chat box, then our friends can read it after the show because we've got to concentrate on the discussion right now. Uh, but it's very important to learn that that was a 1982 case that in the view of Justices Thomas and Sotomayor deviate from the text of the relevant statute. And thank you also, David, for calling our attention to this uh, lawsuit that the court is now being asked to consider. The Washington Post uh, uh, yesterday wrote, Supreme Court asked to reconsider immunity available to police uh, accused of brutality and, and cites to the brief of the Libertarian Cato Institute, which is one of the groups on all sides of the spectrum that have urged the court to revisit the issue, writing that uh, Mr. Floyd's death while in the custody of police officers shows the perversity of the court's rulings on qualified immunity. One federal judge has called the coalition of organizations on the left, right, and middle, perhaps the most diverse amici, that means group of friends of the court, ever assembled. Uh, Janae Nelson, um, uh, tell us about uh, cases uh, that LDF uh, is involved with involving qualified immunity and tell us more about these bills that are pending in Congress to reform it. How and why should it be reformed? So thanks for that question. As you already noted, uh, this is a very interesting area of criminal justice that has brought together a cross ideological alliance the Legal Defense Fund has contributed to briefs along with the Cato Institute, which is not the most common occurrence, but the <laughs> that we coalesce around is the fact that providing zero tolerance uh, or to, to any accountability for police officers leads to the type of uprising uh, that we are seeing today. When there is no accountability in the legal system for those who enforce the laws or who we charged with the duty of enforcing the laws. That can lead to an entire breakdown and disintegration of the trust between communities and those who are sworn to protect and serve them. So there are bills uh, pending in Congress to uh, really try to push back on the common law doctrine that has developed in courts over decades. As, as David pointed out, that was not the text of the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, but it evolved over years through cases like Pearson versus Ray uh, and, and the cases uh, uh, that, that David cited, uh, all the way up to uh, the challenge that we see in circuit courts now where there's no uniformity in how to interpret Section 1983 when it comes to police immunity, that we are literally splitting hairs on facts when it comes to whether officers understand that there is an established constitutional right uh, given the circumstances that, that lead to the particular charge. And, and as Judge McKee pointed out, in this context, we're talking about civil liability. There are also lots of concerns about the failures of the criminal system, of US attorneys and district attorneys and grand juries having the courage uh, and, and the direction and the leadership from those who are sworn to do justice uh, to hold police officers to account in the criminal system. So when you have a failure of accountability in both the civil and criminal systems, 
you are encouraging a lawless uh, set of, of, of law enforcement officers who can act with impunity. And I think that's what we saw when we looked at the horrifying tape and killing of George Floyd, that we saw an officer with his hands in his pockets looking squarely into the camera of a crowd of people letting him know that he was actually kneeling the life out of an individual and he continued with great assurance that he would likely not be prosecuted. And hopefully this is a case, this is one of the many cases of police violence where we will see a change in the will of the judiciary, uh, in the prosecutors, and in all who are involved in the criminal justice system who can bring justice to George Floyd and his family. Thank you for that, uh, those powerful uh, remarks. Uh, and for reminding us that it's not just qualified immunity on the civil side, but also uh, failures in the law of criminal accountability that are uh, being discussed for reform. Uh, uh, Ted Shaw, uh, one of our uh, friends uh, asked, um, what is the pending federal legislation about qualified immunity? I'm just reading from the uh, Discussion of the bill uh, sponsored by uh, Senators Harris, uh, Representative Markey, uh, Senators Harris, Markey, and, and Booker. Their resolution calls for the elimination of qualified immunity for law enforcement officials. Uh, Professor Shaw, would elimination be the best solution? And perhaps you could also talk, in light of your long experience as, as, as head of uh, LDF, um, about the need for reform on the criminal as well as the civil side. Uh, well, um, you know, obviously qualified immunity, if it were eliminated, that would change the, the balance of how these cases uh, and instances of um, uh, alleged police misconduct and uh, that those that lead to the death of, uh, of African Americans and others, uh, and uh, those that don't need to death, but nonetheless a, a significant injury. I mean, that would change it. Uh, all of us acknowledge and recognize that policing, um, that's a difficult job. It's a dangerous job, and it requires split uh, uh, second decisions um, very often. Um, but having said that, uh, I think part of the problem a big part of the problem is, is the nature of policing in this country and the nature of the relationships between uh, police departments and um, black and brown communities. That nature uh, can be described, um, not ironically given what's happening in the moment, uh, often as an occupation. Uh, and it's an occupation that has been driven uh, in recent decades by the war on drugs, but it goes way back. Um, before that. So I wanted to get that out there, but I also wanted to say it's not just the doctrine of qualified immunity, which is tremendously important, um, but, uh, uh, you know, the law that governs racial discrimination uh, and the laws that particularly apply to police departments uh, go beyond qualified immunity. Uh, so, for example, there are jurisprudential um, standards that have been uh, applied, I think often gratuitously, um, that make it more difficult to hold police departments accountable. I think about uh, uh, you know, Lions versus City of LA, 1982 case, ironically, since David correctly pointed to Harlow, uh, but a 1982 case which involved the use of a chokehold uh, on a black man um, who subsequently sued. I mean, he was injured because of the uh, the chokehold, but the uh, Supreme Court held in Lyons that uh, that individuals, uh, that particular individual, but other individuals don't have standing to sue uh, because they can't show they're going to be subjected to uh, the chokehold in the future. Um, so uh, standards or, or uh, 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 doctrines, I should say, like standing have been used to uh, to blunt or make impossible um, reform of police departments driven by, uh, in part, these lawsuits um, by people who have been subjected to injury and harm. And so there's all kinds of doctrines. And then we go back to the, um, the standards uh, with respect to qualified immunity, 
they parallel the intent standard uh, that uh, has been applied to the 14th Amendment over and over and over again. Uh, it pains me to say more often than not, um, the Constitution has been interpreted in ways uh, that have betrayed uh, the protections of uh, Black and other people of color. Uh, with respect to um, the protection of the laws. And so uh, this is much broader uh, than qualified immunity, although it's certainly about that. Uh, but it goes to the way the Constitution and the laws are interpreted uh, in general. Uh, they often betray uh, Black folks and people of color, even though um, our uh, understanding and our belief uh, is that it's the Constitution. It's the rule of law uh, that um, uh, we should turn to uh, rather than violence um, uh, to look for protections. Uh, the law hasn't always done well uh, in protecting Black folks. I can say more often than not, sadly, uh, doctrinally, it hasn't. The law hasn't always done well in protecting black folks. Those are simple, powerfully true words. And uh, thanks to all of you for that really memorable uh, first round of comments. Friends, the questions are just, uh, just remarkable. Uh, there are 151 of them. I'm gonna suggest to our panelists, you might scroll through the Q&A box as we're talking. And if you see a question or two that you're especially moved to respond to, you can do that in the course of your answer. I'll just tee up a question for each of you. And if you want to pick up one of our uh, friends' questions as well, that would be great. But uh, Monica Bell, I mentioned at the beginning uh, of uh, your introduction this important article you wrote, Police Reform and the Dismantling of Legal Estrangement. And in, in that article, you wrote that there's a um, theory uh, called the legitimacy theory, which emphasizes procedural justice, which gives officers an obligation to treat people with dignity and respect and to behave in a neutral, non-biased way. You argue that what you call legitimacy theory offers an incomplete diagnosis of a policing crisis. And instead you say uh, what you call legal estrangement is a better lens through which scholars and policy officers can understand and respond to the current problems of policing. Tell us more about legal estrangement and why you think it's a more effective way of looking at our current crisis. Right, so I think uh, for decades now, we've framed conversation around the relationship between Black communities and the police as one of distrust without really looking at the actual content of, or asking the question, well, why should Black communities trust the police? I mean, I think we've uh, kind of in our conversation about doctrine um, and the kind of trajectory of the law, we see that uh, the law has not protected Black people most of the time. And um, on a larger scale, the law has been a really status quo type of influence. So when I think about qualified immunity and why we have it, one way to talk about it is the conversation about cases. Another way to talk about it is sociologically, why would the court think it is better to defer to police than to defer to the judgments of Black communities about what is happening? And that's because um, the, the kind of courts play this sort of status quo role. And that's an example of legal estrangement. It's much more systemic than an individual police officer mistreated me or even killed someone. It's actually representative of a much more and collective memory, historical perspective on how the law has operated to exclude Black people from the body politic. And now I think the conversations that are being had around reform are conversations that are much more structural. So what a legal estrangement perspective gets you is to focus less on how we train police officers on an individual level or even a department level for trustworthy um, and to kind of like that sort of kind of direct interaction based um, framework, but instead to think how do we shift the role of policing in society. How do we make it so that courts don't defer to police claims instead of deferring to community claims? Um, these are the types of uh, perspectives we might get from a legal change perspective. And I, um, I just wanna make sure to get this in here. I think that's also, um, Kind of this legal estrangement 
issue is also a reason that the movement right now is not having the same conversation in general that we're having here today. So there's a division between constitutional and legal arguments about policing and the political arguments that are being had about policing. And that is, um, that has increased over the past few decades. And I think it's a real tragedy. We have to start thinking about new ways of constitutionalism that move us beyond uh, the doctrine that comes from courts and instead looks to people to reinterpret what the Constitution's meaning is, realizing that, of course, uh, the enforceability of all that depends on our institutions, but thinking in a much more long-term way about how we change the interpretation of the Constitution. But that, so that's, that's some of the work I think is really important. Thank you very much for all of that. And we've just posted your uh, very important article, Police Reform and the Dismantling of Legal Estrangement, in the chat box, along with some other crucial texts. So friends, uh, please make sure to uh, read it after our discussion. David French, there are many questions about the role of the, uh, Debbie Gatte asks, how should we think of the role of the police, the National Guard, and the military in situations of protests and riots. You, David, served in Iraq. You've been awarded for your bravery, but you, and you've also expressed concern about the deployment of federal and military forces to suppress civilian protests. Tell us about what the law says about under what circumstances the president right. can federalize uh, law enforcement and how you would analyze at a legal manner what has, as a legal matter, what has gone on uh, with regard to the balance between federal and state enforcement over the past uh, week or so? Boy, okay, I'll try to <laughs> unpeel that onion quickly. Um, so as a constitutional matter, the president has inherent authority to put down an actual insurrection. I mean, this is something that is a, a constitutional principle that was solidified um, by actual practice when it came to Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War, when in certain instances, when it came to suppressing segregationist uh, resistance to integration in the, in the South. Now, but the default is the Posse Comitatus Act, which says that federal uh, under troops under control of the president, under federal control, are prohibited from engaging in law enforcement activities unless otherwise specified by act of Congress. So when you see National Guard troops out, say in New York or in my own, uh, you know, own area, Nashville, they are not under federal control. They're under the control of governors, the state governors. At that point, a National Guardsman is more like a state militia than part of the federal, uh, than, the, than the US Army. It's more of like, this is a state militia operating under state authority. Now, this is relatively common to see the National Guard come out under state authority when there is civil unrest. Um, the huge controversy that was generate, began to generate uh, was when, when two things happening around the same time. One, Donald Trump threatens to invoke the Insurrection Act which is a way around posse comitatus, where he can arguably, on his own authority and over the objection of governors upon a presidential finding that the conditions for an Insurrection Act uh, invocation exists, he can take control, federalize the National Guard, or deploy regular army troops into cities. So number one, that's incredibly controversial all on its own. And right when he made the threat, he made the threat to invoke the Insurrection Act about 20 minutes before he did his walk over to St. John's Episcopal Church, where federal troops and fed where federal law enforcement had just attacked, violently attacked, uh, peaceful protesters to clear the way for Trump. So what did that do? That sent a message of number one, uh, Trump is saying he's willing to use his statutory and constitutional authority, if even over governor's objections, to invoke the uh, Insurrection Act and to exert his control over uh, troops putting down civil unrest. And number two, in the one area where his administration had immediate control over uh, protests, they violently attacked peaceful protesters. So now you're beginning to see why number three is happening, which is all kinds of resistance from retired military, Gen General Mattis, 
uh, Mike Mullen, many others going, no, do not. This is, this is deeply disturbing because one of the th there's an, and I'll, I'll wrap with this, there's an internal problem and an external problem the military would have here. Internal problem, the military is remarkably diverse. Um, people do not get recruited to join the United States Army to bash in, to, to charge peaceful protesters in the United States of America. They are recruited into the United States Army to defend the United States Constitution and not to attack peaceful protesters. It would be remarkably divisive within the military to activate and federalize troops and use them on the way Trump already used his authority over federal uh, law enforcement. That, and number two, the external problem is the military, for a lot of reasons, is the single most trusted institution, public institution in the United States, and it's not close. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is because it's one of the most remarkably diverse institutions in the United States. Uh, number two, for decades since its low point after Vietnam, it has been scrupulously nonpartisan and uh, committed to discipline and excellence. The military does not want to risk that public trust and a, by being deployed over the objections of local officials into the cities of America. It doesn't want that. And so what you're seeing is, and I'm, what you're seeing is a, a lot of people outside the military are no longer in the chain of command saying no. And there are a lot of people inside the military who are doing some kind of risky things or inside the chain of command to express their disagreement. I mean, when Mark Esper came out, Secretary of Defense came out and said, don't invoke the Insurrection Act. It's a highly unusual move from a cabinet official to, to provide his advice to the president that publicly. Also, you have seen people like the chief of staff uh, or the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs saying to, sending a message out to all troops, your job is to protect the constitution, including the right of peaceful protest, um, which was a, uh, uh, oh, quite, the, quite the statement made the very day after that walk to St. John's Episcopal Church. So this is, a, this is a very seminal moment, I think, in civil military relations. If the president invokes the Insurrection Act, if unrest continues and the president invokes the Insurrection Act over the objection of governors and mayors, that is going to create a, a real problem uh, in this country and, and create a real tension in civil military relations. And I, I hope that he is, is restrained Either by he's either he's restrains himself or somebody restrains him because uh, that I think that's a, that would be a dangerous moment and not because the military is ill disciplined or inherently dangerous but because it creates a fracture uh, that it, it, it's it's activating the military in conditions that the military was not designed to be activated. Thank you so much for all of that, uh, David, uh, for your service and for helping us understand uh, this crucially important issue and uh, General Mattis's uh, statements that you mentioned can be found in the Atlantic uh, magazine recently and we'll post that in the chat box and uh, we're very grateful for that, um, that insight. Uh, Janae, we have a series of questions from our friends about pending reforms. Uh, Matrey Suresh Kumar asks, what laws can be passed to make the Constitution serve all people more equally? Mark Thomas asked specifically, there's a bill now pending in Congress called the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act. The bill is being held up in debate over whether to include minor injuries as a violation, how do existing legal standards consider define minor injuries. Maybe you could take up some of those and also some of the legislation the, uh, that LDF is, is supporting uh, to bring reform in the wake of recent tragedies. Certainly. Um, I think what this conversation and, and the events around us proves uh, just quite poignantly is that the, the crisis of policing is really a hydra. There's, there are so many aspects to it to tackle, to bring reform, to bring uh, the needed justice, to instill confidence in communities of color in particular, that we have to attack it from multiple angles. So we are supporting the Emmett Till Act. We're supporting um, the the uh, end of qualified immunity. We're also supporting more national oversight of police departments. It, it's it's fascinating that uh, 
the officer, Derek Chauvin, who killed George Floyd, had 18 other disciplinary complaints. And we you know, have no way of knowing about those complaints in states like New York, where you have laws like 50A that protect an officer's disciplinary record from public uh, disclosure. So it's very difficult to regulate a profession when there's such a deep lack of transparency and there are different regulations and rules that pertain to the over 18,000 law enforcement agencies that exist in this country. There needs to be federalized oversight of this profession. You know, as you know, as lawyers, if any one of us were to be disbarred in a particular state and then go try to get barred in another state, we would have to disclose that disbarment to the new state and let them know that there was something that caused our disbarment. That state would then take that into serious consideration. And frankly, the chances of us getting uh, uh, entry in that state, the new state, would probably be quite slim. Quite differently, police officers don't even have to move to another state. They can be discharged from the police department because of egregious misconduct and then go to a neighboring police department or a police department in another state and be hired. That's because there's no transparency in disciplinary records. So one of the other pieces of legislation that we're calling for is the creation of a national database of police misconduct. It is important that we make informed decisions about the people we are charging and we are paying as taxpayers to protect and serve us. But just like Professor Bell said, when we are at the point where we're talking about qualified immunity or we're talking about reporting misconduct, we're already too late. We're already past a point where we should be as a society. That means that our law enforcement officers have broken the trust that we've uh, placed in them to protect and serve us. There are other areas of law that also need reform in addition to qualified immunity. And I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the case of Breonna Taylor. Today, she would have turned 27 years old. This is a young woman who was an EMT worker, an essential worker, whose life was taken because of racialized police violence. And I say that because there was an evolution of the doctrine of, of uh, uh, announcing your knock before entering a home. So under the, four, under the Fourth Amendment, uh, there's something known as the Castle Doctrine that was established in 1995 in a case called Wilson versus Arkansas. And as the name suggests, a person's home is considered their castle. But law enforcement is not allowed to enter a home without announcing itself and giving the occupant an opportunity to allow entry in a peaceful manner. But often law enforcement are asking for no knock entry warrants, which is the one that was used in the Breonna Taylor case that allows them without announcing themselves to engage in uh, uh, sometimes quite brutal and violent forcible entry of the premises. In her case, we understand sprayed her home with bullets without any announcement of their presence. And it's those types of reforms that can prevent that egregious harm to human life, uh, to the, the violence against black bodies that is committed on a routine basis. That is another area of reform that is critically important, not only doctrinally, but also through the legislatures. Thank you so much for that and for noting the connection between the doctrine of no knock entry and the death of Brianna Taylor. And we will post those no knock uh, cases if we can find them during the chat as well. Uh, Monica Bell, lots, many, many questions about legal reform. Mary Izzati asked, would reform in criminal liability be more effective in having a deterrent effect on police officers and the discriminatory conduct versus reform in qualified immunity that will only serve to create civil liability, which does not directly impact police departments, understanding that you're calling our attention to more structural forces that create bias. Are there particular legal reforms, either legislative or doctrinal in the courts uh, that you think are productive? Uh, so I actually just wanted to check one thing. Was Ted Shaw gonna go? Oh, forgive me, I'm so sorry. Yes, thank you very much for uh, keeping me uh, on target. Um, Ted, my apologies, and I'll ask- That's okay, and I, I can wait. 
No, no, we've, we've got to uh, keep, keep, keep in the right order. Um, I'll, ask the same, I'll ask the same question to you because basically our, our questioners are very eager for all of your thoughts about what statutory and doctrinal reforms you think would be most constructive. Well, we, we've been talking about statutory reform with respect to uh, qualified immunity, um, uh, other legal reforms. Uh, you know, I think that um, as I alluded to, the Supreme Court ought to revisit um, uh, Lyons' case and open up the door to more um, uh, uh, regulation of police departments. Um, uh, I think that would be a good thing. Um, but some of this is, I think, uh, uh, really public policy stuff. Uh, you know, I, I think it's important uh, that the relationship between police departments and uh, black communities change in fundamental ways. I said before that I think police departments uh, often have a, an occupation mentality, and I reference the war on drugs, which I think is a hugely important context um, for how uh, police departments or individual police officers um, interact and how they perceive their, their role. Uh, uh, you know, we haven't talked about the uh, the militarization uh, of uh, police departments in recent years. Uh, the Obama administration walked some of that back, but under the Trump administration, once again, um, they have been militarized uh, in ways that I think um, open up opportunities for more confrontations with uh, peaceful protesters, for example, um, that's problematic. Um, and I think that, and I'm not sure how to do this, but I can't help but not, uh, I can't help uh, mentioning the, the ways in which uh, white individuals who interact with police departments um, and who are accused of crimes um, are treated, or even if it's not a matter of being accused of crimes. My wife reminds me all the time about when Dylan Roof was arrested after he murdered nine African Americans in church in Charleston, South Carolina, on his way to the police station. They stopped and bought him hamburgers. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, black folks, when they get um, arrested by the police, don't get hamburgers. <laughs> um, uh, I also uh, think about the ways in which uh, protesters have been interacting with law enforcement and they feel uh, with respect to this, uh, uh, the virus, um, white protesters armed to the teeth feel safe and comfortable and within their rights citing the second amendment um, and the Second Amendment does exist, that's another conversation, but walking right on up to law enforcement, uh, their faces contorted with rage and anger within inches of these individuals screaming, uh, there's no black person who would do that and get away with it that I see. So the ways in which we interact and the police interact with people, um, uh, you know, are color coded uh, in important respects. What do we do about that? Well, uh, I don't have all of the answers. I know that we have to be conscious of these disparities. Um, and, um, uh, you know, they, you know, black folks are often gaslighted when we talk about uh, these kind of inequities, these kind of inequalities. Uh, the gaslighting has to stop. I think that's one of the things that, as Judge McKee indicated, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how hopeful I am, but one thing that we are seeing is more white people marching and appearing to get it. How long that's going to last, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I, I do feel that that's a cause for hope um, uh, as opposed to uh, despair. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for your service. As head of LDF, Ben Weirin asks, what is LDF again? I missed this. This is the Legal Defense and Education Fund, the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, which Ted Shaw led with great distinction and which Janae now serves with great distinction. Uh, 
Monica Bell, you've, you've heard so much to bring together questions about what uh, legal, statutory, and doctrinal reforms you'd support. Lots of questions about the balance. Uh, Ted Shaw just mentioned the Second Amendment, the balance between First and Second Amendment rights of protest, um, as well as some pending lawsuits against the police for uh, targeting reporters, as well as for discriminatory enforcement of curfews. So please take up any strands of those that you think would be most constructive. Absolutely. So um, thank you for the question. Uh, I think one of the main, uh, I guess there, there are a few themes in the types of reforms I would support. Um, and one of the major themes is that it not look that those reforms not just look at policing as if it's a freestanding injustice and a freestanding entity. So one of the questions in the chat box that I kind of wanted to get to was this idea of, you know, how do we come to grips with racism in America? And one of, of the things that is both heartening, or one of the things that's heartening about the moment we're in right now is that more white people recognizing um, the, grave, the gravity of um, racial injustice that uh, black communities face. However, I worry a bit that that uh, conception of what racism looks like is too localized. It's too much about policing on its own and it's too much about particular sort of physical violence when there is structural violence and symbolic violence through the through mechanisms of residential segregation and a lack of educational opportunity, et cetera, that are actually intertwined with a lot of what we see in policing. So we need a much more comprehensive racial justice agenda and we can't be satisfied with tinkering around inside internally to policing. So, um, so what might some of those other pieces look like? So, uh, and thinking about coming to grips, um, history and what has happened across history is really important. And very few Americans actually know much about the particular aspects of slavery, about particular aspects of the history of lynching and how it was legally supported and how police were tacitly a part of this. Very few people actually understand how uh, in times when Black people have tried to integrate predominantly white neighborhoods that there isn't just private violence but also state supported and state allowed violence that has kept those communities separate and that's in so much of what we actually observe in terms of racial inequality now is tethered not to you know poor choices that black people made it's not this kind of neoliberal world in which there's just been a lot of choice it's actually Kind of the constraint and um, it is all supported by a legal framework. And so uh, educating people about those things, making them core parts of our curriculum, those are reforms that I think are really important because I think as um, the judge and as Ted Shaw was say was saying, it's like, I have hope, but it's truncated a bit by having a knowledge of history, having seen movements evolve over time and having been excited in the past about reforms that were possible, but that never quite happened. And I think one of the reasons they don't is because we, we tinker around with, thought, with law without really changing the ideology underlying the law. And one of the key ways in which we do that is by tearing down the enduring structures of racism, like segregation, like a complete ignorance of our, of our history, both recent and in the past. And so I really, need like i'm only really going to be excited about reforms that dig into those issues um and and aren't just kind of, kind of minimal doctrinal changes although those incremental changes are of course also important thanks for that call for powerful meaningful structural reform rather than uh, minimal doctrinal changes thanks also for the crucial emphasis on the importance of teaching people about our difficult history and the Constitution. And of course, that's what the Constitution Center is trying to do with programs like this. All of these programs and our educational resources are archived on the internet <coughs> the Constitution. And if you click on the 13th, the 14th, and 15th Amendments, you'll find early drafts of those amendments, as well as all of the historical and, and contemporary learning that we can possibly collect so uh, that citizens can educate themselves. Um, in this extraordinary experiment of a national town hall, I'm so 
struck that we've had uh, up to uh, 1,400 uh, viewers, friends participating in the town hall, and we have 224 questions. What a wonderful example of people um, asking and engaging. This is going to be the last round for each of us because the only rule of these programs is they end on time. So David, I'll ask for your closing thoughts. There are a series of questions about the military uh, state balance and also about the rights of protesters and uh, the police. Uh, there's a, there is a lawsuit uh, filed in Minnesota that says that the police targeted reporters. Uh, the ACLU of Southern California is suing about the draconian curfews put in place. Other questioners asked if the military can be used about protesters. Your thoughts on your, your, your concluding thoughts on, on which of whatever those themes you find most uh, meaningful. Yeah, you know, going on the, the military point, the National Guard, when it's under the control of the governors, is essentially operating less as an instrument of the broader United States military and more as a, um, a, a police force under the control of the governors of the states. And they're going to have all of the same, they're going to have all of the same uh, constitutional obligations on the National Guard that are on the police and their interactions with citizens. And that number one obligation is to protect the constitutional rights of the citizens of the state or of the city. And that includes protecting the right of protest. Um, now the right of protest obviously does not include violent activity uh, and, and, and there are curfews that are sometimes necessary when violence breaks out. But I have the same analysis that applies to curfews that often applies to say, for example, shelter at home orders in a pandemic. An order that is valid when given is not necessarily, is not permanently valid. It is not indefinitely valid. And so extending curfews beyond their, uh, beyond the time in which they're necessary is a constitutional problem, for example. But let me, let me sort of close by uh, planting my civil libertarian, flying my civil libertarian flag for a moment on, on what can we do from a policy basis more broadly. We've talked about qualified immunity. I want to very briefly bring up two other things, and I'm cribbing this from my friend Jane Coaston at Vox. Um, I'll call it the Jane Coaston plan. Three points in qualified immunity, two, reform police unions. Police unions bargain for two broad categories of things. One is uh, wages and benefits. How much money you're going to get paid, what's your pension, et cetera. They also bargain about the terms and conditions of their employment, which includes discipline, which includes how much, okay, what are they, how can they be held accountable for misconduct. That is something that often essentially removes from broader public policy debates, the actual way in which you hold your, uh, uh, cops accountable and puts it into a collective bargaining process that is often, uh, you know, it's one of the things that we've almost talk about, uh, you know, Professor Bell's talking about um, public knowledge. How many people know about collective bargaining agreements for police unions? I mean, <laughs> one out of a thousand. So reform police unions, and here's the last one. We need a fewer criminal laws in this country. We need to criminalize fewer things. You know, Eric Garner was, died. What was the, what was the predicate for arresting him? Selling Lucy cigarettes. Not to get all libertarian and everything, but I feel like I should be able, if I have five extra cigarettes, to sell them without violating the law. I mean, you know, we, we, we criminalize so many things and that, you know what that does is it increases the amount of citizen police interaction dramatically. And we need to think about what are the things that we really want to say that are so egregious that your violation of this norm can lead to your imprisonment. We really need to have a hard, hard conversations about that. Uh, and so uh, those are, you know, that's, that's the coast and plan. Unqualified <laughs> immunity, um, reform police unions, and let's think about fewer uh, criminal laws. That doesn't solve everything, doesn't solve most things, but I kind of view it as a decent start. Thank you so much, David French. Janine Nelson, your final thoughts. Well, I want to encourage everyone who's listening, and I'm so encouraged by the fact that there are over a thousand people here to encourage us in this moment to completely rethink public safety. 
to think about how we spend money as taxpayers to fund a system that is fundamentally broken. None of us is suggesting that we don't want some form of safety, that there doesn't need to be some form of control or some form of law enforcement. But we have invested so much in a very particular way of policing society that is not working for so many in society and is creating divisions that are, that are deep and, and, and destructive. And you may hear calls for defunding the police. And I want to unpack very quickly what that means, at least for the Legal Defense Fund, what that means. That does not mean that there can't be a, a, a safety mechanism. What it means is that we put too much money in social support, I mean, too much money away from social support services and not enough money investing in the mental support services, the social support, the educational resources, and the things that can make society truly great. When we think about the amount of money, for example, that the city of New York spent in settling police misconduct cases in the year of 2018, we spent $230 million settling police misconduct cases. The city of Chicago spent $113 million settling those types of cases. Imagine if we used that money to invest in public schools, to invest in social services, to invest in ways to build and lift society and to take people out of the margins and into the center. We wouldn't have the problem of policing that, that we have, have today if we were to redirect those resources. So I encourage us to think about whether we actually need a person with a gun enforcing traffic laws, whether we need police at schools to ensure that children behave safely. My answer is we absolutely don't. This is the time to rethink, completely reimagine public safety in America. Thank you very much for that, Janae Nelson. Uh, Ted Shaw, Shaw, the last words in this memorable discussion are to you. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you again for uh, allowing me to participate. Um, uh, you know, I, what uh, Janae Nelson just said made me think about, um, you know, uh, Great Britain. Um, they have law enforcement offices. Uh, they don't have the uh, shootings we have and the, um, and the numbers we have uh, because their first instinct isn't uh, to shoot people. Um, so we should rethink um, uh, policing. Uh, but I also want to lastly connect what has happened uh, with this long history of killings and deaths of unarmed Black people. I want to put in here also, it's not just men, it's women also, um, as we know because of Brianna Taylor, but we can mention a whole bunch of other people. But I wanna draw a line between the police officer who knelt so cavalierly on the neck um, of George Floyd and Floyd and took his life. I wanna draw a line between him um, and the individuals who killed uh, Ahmaud Arbery. Um, uh, we just got news yesterday or more information about uh, what one of them said after he stood over his body. Uh, and I uh, want to draw a line between um, the, the ways in which um, private individuals who take on the task of, of policing also act out in ways that take the lives of black folks. Uh, they're connected and we can't forget about the events that are going on in this country now with respect to policing. And at the same time, uh, we need to talk about changing laws and practices uh, that go to how um, private individuals um, act um, and assume um, the color of law, even if they are actually not law enforcement officers, um, and take the lives of Black people. Um, so thank you for this discussion. Thank you for uh, the, um, uh, the opportunity to participate. Uh, there's a lot to despair about, but we have to choose hope. That's my own personal belief. It's not that 
you know, we, we don't have things to be uh, hopeless about, uh, but that's not a viable choice. And so uh, thank you for what you do in, um, in focusing, refocusing us uh, on hope. Beautiful words in which to end a memorable discussion. I need to thank all of you, wonderful panelists, uh, Monica Bell, David French, Janae Nelson, uh, Ted Shaw, and Judge McKee uh, for a memorable and civil and inspiring discussion. Friends, we did not know what to expect when we invited you here in the middle of the day on short notice to discuss the most difficult constitutional issues in American life. And I'm heartened by the rigor and civility of the discussion. 251 questions in the chat box, each of them on point, serious, and hungry for learning in an open spirit. One of you has asked, can we share the chat questions? And we will, we will do that. I've just copied them and we'll post them on the website uh, or email them to you. And so I need to end by thanking you, friends of the Constitution Center, friends of learning uh, uh, Americans for educating yourself about the Constitution. The Constitution Center stands here ready to help you by serving our urgently important role as a convening space. We will continue to hold these discussions. Several of you are already asking for them. Our next one uh, is scheduled on June 30th in uh, co-sponsorship with the Atlantic Magazine. We're gonna hold a symposium that will continue to explore uh, the issues that we've taken up today. That'll be June 30th at uh, 7 p.m. So stay involved with the Constitution Center, stay engaged, uh, and most importantly of all, continue to educate yourself about the Constitution. To all of our panelists and friends, thank you so much. Stay safe. See you soon. <laughs>